Folks, welcome back to another episode of The Fallen Badge. Today we're going to look at the murder of Deputy Cal Dinkheller, Lawrence County Sheriff's Office, Georgia. Folks, before we get started, I was going to give y'all a heads up that I am not going to play any video segments that have audio included. Everything will be silent and short. I'm going to show some still pictures. Now, I will have in the resource material, reference material where you can go to and you can watch the entire video with or without audio. I've seen the video I don't know how many times when I was at in service with Memphis or at some officer survival school and I can assure you I don't ever want to have to hear that video again. It's very disturbing. Deputy Dean Keller was 22 years old. He had four years with the Lawrence County Sheriff's Office. Now, he had started there as a deputy jailer when he was 18, I believe. And he worked his way up from that to being a road deputy, and then he got on their interstate unit. Now, he was married. They had a 22-month-old daughter, and his wife was pregnant with what would be a son. That son would be born in September of 1998. Never going to see his daddy. Now, the suspect in this case had fought in Vietnam. In fact, you probably could say he had, if not a hero, you could say he was a cut above. He had received the Bronze Star and some other medals while he served in Vietnam. Now, unfortunately, he came home with issues, PTSD. So I think the suspect was living in a dark place. And I don't know how much help the federal government or the military was providing him. But we'll get into more of that later. Now, Officer Dinkeller always wanted to be the police. And when he started as a deputy jailer making about $500 a week, he just, he'd just tell anybody that was listening how much he, he loved his job and loved working with everybody around him. Now, he became a road deputy, and then he got on the interdiction unit there. Now, that interstate unit, I believe there they called it the Interstate Criminal Enforcement Unit. Now, that interstate that they was sitting on that they watched was I-16, and that was the main corridor between Atlanta and Savannah. Now, the information I'm going to use for this case comes from the Georgia Supreme Court. Now, it's January 12, 1998. The suspect... He left his mama's house in Stockbridge, Georgia, and he's coming up I-16, and he's got his little white pickup truck. Now, when he rolls past Deputy Dinkheller, his radar gun in the car is saying the suspect's rolling at 98 miles an hour. So now, Deputy Dinkheller, he gets on the interstate and starts trying to catch up to the suspect. Now, the suspect, he gets off right there at the gets off at exit 42 that's the Dudley exit that's highway 338 there I think the suspect lived there around uh, Dublin so now it takes a minute or two for Deputy Dinkeller to catch up now by the time he's finally caught up to the suspect the suspect's done gotten off the exit hung right there on Whipple Crossing Road and that's where Deputy Dinkeller finally lit him up now of course as soon as the deputy activates his blue lights that should have his video camera coming on and the deputy's also got a microphone that's attached to his uniform now the suspect he gets out of the truck and he stands by the driver's door deputy dinkheller he he comes up there on the left front side of his squad car now the deputy advises the suspect says step step back here to me come on back here to me suspect says okay then he didn't move. Well, the deputy says, come on back. And then he says, how you doing? 
Well, the suspect, he says, okay. And he asked the deputy, uh, and asked how the deputy's doing. But the suspect still hadn't moved away from the truck. Now, Deputy Dinkeller, he, he told the suspect he was doing good, and he, again, he requested that the suspect come back here so he could talk to him, and if he could, get his hands out of his pocket. The suspect asked him why, and the deputy just tells him, get your hands out of your pockets. Well, then the suspect, he gets upset, and he tells the uh, deputy to do some things that are anatomically impossible to do, and then he tells the deputy to just shoot me. And then he starts doing a little dance there in the street, saying, here I am, here I am. Well, that right there, I'm sure that told Deputy Dinkeller that he's got an individual that's that's probably a mental consumer, which is a scary thing when you're by yourself. So now the Deputy Dinkeller, he did good. He got on his radio and he asked for another car, which is good because he knows it's going to be a problem now. So the suspect, he all of a sudden stops dancing and he approaches the deputy and Deputy Dinkeller tells him, sir, you need to get back. And the suspect says, who are you calling? And then he rushes at the deputy and there's some kind of a small little physical confrontation. It's to the left of the squad car and it's off camera. Well, just a second or two later, the suspect's back in the back in range of the camera. So now the suspect's hollering at the deputy, and the deputy's deputy Dinkeller has now decided that distance is a good thing. So he's asking the suspect to now step back. And the suspect he's hollering at the deputy, telling him he's a Vietnam combat vet. Well, then all of a sudden the suspect he hurriedly goes back to his truck. He's got the driver's door open. He begins, he's rummaging around in there, around the seat, trying to get something. Now, Deputy Dinkeller, he's by his patrol car, and he's telling the suspect to get out of the car. And he's still being polite. He's saying, sir, get out of the car. Now, Deputy Dinkeller has pulled his baton, but he has not pulled his pistol. Now, the suspect, he hollers at the, the deputy, and he says, uh, I'm in fear for my life. Well, Deputy Dinkeller, he hollers back. He says, well, I'm in fear for my life, so get back out here now. Suspect says no, and then he pulls out a M1 carbine, 30 caliber, from his truck. Now, the deputy, Dinkeller, he gets back on his radio, and He's saying, I need help. Got an armed party. And by now, he's now pulled his gun. And he's given commands to the suspect to drop the rifle. The suspect's not dropping the rifle. He's just crouched down there by the door. Now, this goes on, I guess, three or four times. The deputy is shouting at the suspect to drop the gun, and he doesn't do it. Now... According to the Georgia Supreme Court, they're saying that the suspect opened fire first and then the deputy returned fire. Now, I saw some resource material that indicated that Deputy Dinkeller may have fired the first round. Any event, shots are exchanged. Now, Deputy Dinkeller was hit. He's down behind his car. He gets back on his radio and advising he's been hit. Now the suspect, of course, military trained, so he's advancing by fire. So he's firing as he moves up to the deputy's car. He gets to the front of it. Deputy Dinkeller, he's at the back of it. And they're exchanging gunfire. Now the suspect, he runs through one magazine. He drops that one, loads another one, continues to fire. And, of course, now the microphone that the deputy's got on, it's recording his screams, and you hear the rounds hitting his body. Now, at the trial later on, the medical examiner would say that by the time Deputy Dinkeller, by this stage of the gunfight, had been struck at least nine times, arms, legs, buttocks, chest, and finally in the head. 
medical examiner went on to say that even though you can still hear the deputy breathing into the microphone, that his belief is the deputy has lost consciousness because he's no longer returning fire and he's no longer crying out in pain. Now, there's a point in the video where it looks like the suspect might be returning to his truck. It's at a point when he's in, he's in between the squad car and the truck and he actually gets hit. Deputy Dinkeller, one of his rounds hits the suspect in the stomach and you see the suspect react. But then the suspect comes over there to the front and left front side of the squad car and he crouches down and he takes aim and he says something pretty ugly and he cranks off one more round and that was the round that hit Deputy Dinkeller in the head. So the suspect, he goes back to his truck, gets in, and he leaves. He's heading back to his, he's going to head to his house. Now, the shootout lasted three minutes and eight seconds, according to the dash camera in Deputy Dinkeller's car. Now, his partner was over 15 miles away. Well, his partner was rolling. In fact, the partner later said that the first call went out during that first minute, and he said that second minute he can hear his partner, Deputy Dinkeller, calling for help, and you can hear that the situation's gotten bad. And a little bit after that two-minute mark, Deputy Dinkeller is talking so fast the words are running together. He advises radio, got a man with a gun. Now, when he got pretty close about that third minute or so he's on the radio and he's calling for Deputy Dinkeller and he's going are you 10-4 in other words are you okay and there's no answer now he gets there and he sees the radar display in the squad car and it's flashing 98 so that tells him that whatever the suspect did speeding was part of it and he sees the Deputy Dink Heller's ticket book on the hood of the car. Now, Deputy Dink Heller, is, he's lying behind his car, and he's surrounded by blood and spent ammunition. Now, when the supervisor got there, and I think finally the sheriff, they got the tape out of the trunk. When this first started, these onboard cameras, they had a VCR tapes. Some of you listening to this may not know what a VCR tape is, but anyways, they didn't want to try to drive back to the sheriff's department, so the sheriff had a friend that lived nearby, and they all loaded up in cars and went to his house, and they watched that video to try to get the information on who the suspect was. The suspect, he lived out in the woods there, and as I mentioned, near Dublin, which sits in about square in the middle of the county. Now, the house doesn't have any running water or electricity. It's basically like he was still living in Vietnam. Now, the police got out there. By the next day, they found him. He was about 100 yards out in the woods. Now, you think he laid out in the woods all night. Gut shot. And they found the, the rifle inside the house. Now case went to court and the suspect pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity which he probably wasn't too far from the truth but I hold the military and the federal government responsible for letting this man be out like he was because he sure shouldn't have been out and he sure shouldn't have killed Deputy Dinkeller now he was found guilty January 28, 2000 and he was sentenced to death. January 2nd, 2015, the state of Georgia says they're going to execute him within the next 10 or 15 days. January 13th of 2015, the suspect is executed by lethal injection. Deputy Kyle Wayne 
Dean Keller. End of Watch, January 12th, 1998.